What is structural equation modelling? Well, I think one of the first useful things to understand about SEM, as I'll refer to it, is that it isn't a, a single technique as such. Um, we wouldn't want to compare it to, say, learning ordinary least squares regression or logistic regression, uh, log linear modelling, which, although these techniques have a number of different aspects, we can think of them um, as, if you like, single approaches uh, to address uh, research questions. I think SEM is much better thought of as a, a general modelling framework uh, that integrates a number of different multivariate techniques uh, into this, this overall framework. Um, it's a framework which draws on uh, a number of different disciplines. It brings together measurement theory from psychology, factor analysis also from psychology and statistics, path analysis from epidemiology and biology, regression modelling from statistics, and simultaneous equations from econometrics. And all of these different techniques come together uh, to form structural equation modelling as a general modelling environment. Um, and it's also a, an environment which is somewhat dynamic. It is not uh, set in stone at this point in time. It is uh, actually often integrating new ways of uh, fitting models uh, as the technique develops over time. What sort of research questions would SEM be particularly suitable for addressing? Well, I think it, it's being a general model fitting uh, environment, it can address many different kinds of research questions, but I think it's particularly suitable uh, in situations where the key constructs, the key uh, concepts that a researcher is interested in are complex and multifaceted, uh, often uh, relating to psychological, social psychological uh, concepts. So um, these kinds of uh, concepts can be quite difficult to measure um, and are often measured with error. And one of the uh, useful aspects of SEM, as we'll see, is its ability to make corrections for errors of measurement. Other kinds of research questions that SEM is well suited to are ones which specify systems of relationships, rather than as we may be used to if we're fitting regression models where we have a single dependent variable and a set of predictors or independent variables, structured equation models may have uh, numerous different outcomes or dependent variables, each of which is affecting um, other dependent variables in a more complex system. So if a researcher is interested in modeling a, a causal system, um, then structured equation models are particularly suitable. Another kind of research question that uh, structural equation models are often used to address is where the researcher is interested in indirect or mediated effects. So in many research uh, questions, we're interested in the effect of variable x on variable y. That would be thought of as the direct effect of x on y. But in many uh, research contexts, we're interested in more complex kinds of relationships where uh, the first variable x perhaps influences a second variable z, which then has a, a second effect on y. That would be seen as an indirect effect, and SEMs are very well suited to uh, addressing those kinds of mediated research questions. Now, SEMs are uh, known by a number of different names uh, in the existing literature, and this can be uh, somewhat confusing. Um, sometimes they're referred to as covariance structure analysis models. This relates to the, the fact that with SEMs, we're actually uh, analyzing uh, covariance matrices, not var variables directly. We'll come on to that uh, in later films. Um, they're also known as analysis of moment structures. This is what gives the, uh, the software, the, the, the SEM software, AMOS its name, um, because this is in recognition of the fact that the more, more modern SEMs analyze not just covariances, but also means, so higher order moments. Um, 
It's also known sometimes as a Lisrael model, um, which again takes its name from possibly the most uh, well-known software, certainly the first software for fitting SEMS, which is uh, Lisrael. Um, more controversially, SEMS have been referred to as causal modelling, um, and they're often, uh, certainly have historically been associated with uh, analyses which get at causal effects. Um, but I think that is um, probably a more controversial name to give to any modelling technique because the, uh, the, the claims for causal inference will come from the research design rather than the statistical model that we apply to analyse the data. There are many different software packages that are available for fitting SEMS, um, and this is a list that's changing and growing all the time. As I mentioned, the probably best known is uh, Lisrael, which was developed by uh, Carl Yoroskog and, and Sorbon, one of the first uh, available packages. Now there are many more uh, software packages available, M+, EQS, AMOS, uh, R is a free package, Stata, um, and many of these uh, packages have uh, more limited uh, versions that are available for free for students to download and, and try to see which one is most suitable. I wouldn't want to make a recommendation uh, for any particular software package. Each one has uh, its own particular advantages and disadvantages. So, what is structural equation modelling? Well, there are many possible answers to that question. Uh, the one that I'm going to propose in this film is that SEM can be thought of as path analysis using latent variables. Now, this definition may not be very helpful to you if you aren't very familiar with either path analysis or latent variables, so for the remainder of the module I'm going to run through what path analysis is and what latent variables are. So. What are latent variables? Well, most of the concepts that we're interested in in social science are not directly observable. Things like intelligence, social capital, trust. It's very impossible to go and put some kind of meter into people and get a direct reading of their level of social capital uh, or trust. So this makes these concepts hypothetical or latent as we refer to them. We believe that they are latent within people uh, at some level and that they, they drive uh, attitudes and behaviour, uh, but we can't actually directly observe them. So we're in a bit of a difficult position if we can't measure these concepts that we're interested in, but fortunately we can use uh, approaches which measure these latent variables using uh, observable indicators using variables that we can measure directly that we believe to be uh, caused by the underlying latent constructs. So if we uh, think of a, a questionnaire item, a, a question in a, in a questionnaire that's been administered to a sample of people, um, this would be a good example of uh, an observable indicator of a latent construct. So let's imagine that this question asks people uh, how happy they are with their lives on a scale of 1 to 10. Now some people will give higher answers or lower answers. There will be variability, uh, variance in this variable across the, the individuals in the sample. Um, now we don't think that all of that variability is only to do with people's level of happiness. Some of it will be. So some of the variability will be caused by variability in the true level of happiness across people, but there will be other factors that also uh, cause variability, possibly to do with the questionnaire design, the temperature in the room, whether the question is ad administered by an interviewer or completed on a computer. These are all other factors that we're not really interested in in what we're trying to measure, which is happiness. So some of the variability will be to do with happiness, the latent construct, um, but some of the variability will be due to other factors, uh, error and unique variance. So uh, we can summarise these ideas quite simply in this formula, the true score uh, uh, equation, where x equals t plus e. So here 
the measured variable, the observed indicator, is x. And as I said, the x, the variability in x, is comprised of both true score and of error. So the true score is simply where the individual is on the true happiness dimension, their true underlying uh, level of happiness. The error comprises two components. The first is what we could think of as systematic error. This is a, a bias where perhaps the question is phrased in a way which makes people uh, give higher happiness ratings uh, than, they, they, than their actual level of happiness. Maybe it's because it's a question administered by an interviewer and they don't want to seem unhappy because that's socially undesirable. This would be a, a systematic error. Um, a random error would be one where you're just as likely to overrate as to underrate your happiness. So we can think of the, the systematic error as being one where the, the mean of the individual errors doesn't cancel out, it doesn't equal zero. Whereas a random error, you're as likely to give a, a higher as a lower score. So the expectation would be that the, means, the mean of the errors would cancel out and be zero. So, this is all by way of saying that when we measure uh, a variable, when we measure x, ideally what we would be uh, able to isolate would be the t part of the variance, the true score, and to remove the error variance when we're trying to either predict uh, t or use t as a predictor uh, in a model. So we can now translate this true score equation into a very simple path diagram, which is uh, key to uh, representing structural equation models. So here we can see that the, the x reads over to being the observed item in the rectangle, the t reads over to being the, the latent variable, the true score in the ellipse, and the e reads over to being the circle at the top of the diagram, the error. And the arrows indicate that the observed score is caused by both the, the true score, the latent variable, and by other factors, the error. So we can, we can encapsulate those ideas in this simple path diagram. It would be nice if we could implement this as a statistical model. Unfortunately, when we only have one indicator of the latent variable, if this is happiness, um, then this equation is what we would call unidentified. We have more unknown pieces of quantities that we're trying to estimate, the T and the E, we don't know what they are and we would like to estimate them, than we have known pieces of information, the X. We've measured X in our sample. We have two unknowns and one known, so we can't solve that equation uniquely. The equation is unidentified. So we can't separate the true score from the error when we only have one measure of the uh, underlying concept. What this then tells us is that we need to have multiple indicators of our latent constructs. When we have multiple indicators, then we can start to uh, over-identify the, the true score equation and estimate the, the quantities of T and E for each indicator. So we can apply many different kinds of latent variable models. We can um, use uh, principal components analysis, factor analysis, latent class models, depending on the metrics of the observed uh, indicators that we have uh, in our data set. But what these are all going to do is to uh, pr provide us with a summary score, a reduced set of factors or components relative to the full set of indicators that we start out with. And in doing that, they will correct for the error in each of the individual indicators and give us a, a better measure of the true score of the concept. We can represent this simply here uh, with a, a common factor model. Here we have four measured variables. Let's think of these as questionnaire items. Again, they might be measuring happiness, different aspects of happiness. Are you happy at home, with your work, with your friends, and so on. So we've got four indicators of the same underlying uh, latent variable, happiness. Now, 
because they measure the same thing, we would generally expect these variables to be correlated in our, uh, in our population. And that's what these double-headed arrows indicate. Um, the curved double-headed arrows indicate that the x's are all correlated with one another. That's one way of representing what's going on here. Another way would be to do away with these correlations and add in the underlying latent variable, someone's true level of happiness, which we've here denoted as eta. In this model, now, we have happiness, latent variable, having a causal effect on each of the indicators, and that causal effect is what we can think of as the, the true score, the t part in our x, plus, x equals t plus e equation. Now, if that's the case, then we also need to have error terms for each of these uh, equations here, and that's what we show in the diagram there. So, with these multiple indicators, we can apply a latent variable, in this case a, a factor model, um, and we can get empirical estimates of these key quantities. And here now, the, the lambda coefficients there in this model we'll refer to as factor loadings, and these are the correlation between the factor, the eta, and each of the x variables. Now, if these are good, if these indicators are good indicators of happiness, we would expect these correlations to be high. We would expect the correlation between a good indicator of the latent construct and the latent construct to be close to or approaching one. So, if we are able to uh, measure our constructs with late, uh, multiple indicators, we can apply latent variable models, um, and this brings a number of benefits. Well, firstly, the kinds of things that we're interested in modelling in social science are generally complex and multifaceted. If we think of happiness, for example, it's difficult to come up with a single question which covers all aspects of a person's uh, individual well-being. So, we probably need to have multiple indicators to get a good coverage of the concept. As I mentioned, it also enables us to uh, remove or at least reduce random error in the construct that we're measuring. Um, this, I think, we can convince ourselves that removing error seems to be a good thing to do, uh, but more formally, we can demonstrate that if we have random error in a, in a dependent variable, although it leaves the, the estimates in a model unbiased, these will be less precisely measured. There'll be a, a noisier measure with wider confidence intervals. More seriously, perhaps, if we have random error in independent variables, then uh, regression coefficients that we estimate using those independent variables will be attenuated. They will be smaller than they are in the population, systematically smaller, tending towards zero. So we will underestimate effect sizes and we will uh, falsely uh, fail to reject the null hypothesis. So, what is path analysis? Well, again, there are many ways that we could answer this question, um, but I think uh, a key feature of path analysis, um, and one that makes it very appealing um, as part of structured equation modelling for social scientists, is that the model that you're wanting to fit to the data is represented diagrammatically, rather than in the form of equations. Uh, of course, we can represent the structured equation model as a system of equations, but we can also represent it as a, as a diagram. And this visual aspect, again, is very appealing uh, for social scientists who are perhaps less comfortable uh, and less intuitive in their reading of uh, equations. So the standardised notation of path analysis uh, is a very important feature. Uh, but path analysis uh, presents uh, regression equations between our measured variables. So we're interested again in kind of systems of relationships between multiple uh, uh, observed variables. Now that's important that I'm saying observed variables there because uh, in a standard path analysis we would not be using latent variables but variables which are uh, directly observed. Again perhaps single questionnaire items, other kinds of measures. A third key feature of path analysis is its focus not just on direct effects 
but also, as I was talking about earlier, on indirect effects and total effects. So for research questions where we don't have a simple linear model, where we're estimating the effects of some set of predictor variables on an outcome, a dependent or a criterion, but we're interested in the pathways between uh, multiple independent variables and possibly multiple dependent variables. So in this slide I'm presenting some of the, uh, the standardized notation, the way that we represent different parts of the model using diagrammatic notation. We can see at the top um, a measured latent variable, so a latent variable would be presented as an ellipse. An observed or manifest variable, such as a questionnaire item that we might use as an indicator of a, uh, a measured latent variable, would be a rectangle. An error variance or a disturbance term is a, a small circle. And there's a, a, a similarity with the measured latent variable there. They're both circular shaped um, because an error variance is also a latent variable. Um, it's just that we are not specifying it as measuring anything in particular. It is the, uh, what's left over, the residual or disturbance term. A covariance path. Uh, where we're specifying that two variables in the model are related, are correlated with one another, um, would be represented as a, uh, a curved double-headed arrow. This is a, a non-directional association. We're not specifying there is any uh, causal link from one variable to another, but we want to indicate that they are correlated. And finally, the uh, single-headed straight arrow represents a directional path or what we would uh, generally think of as implying causality in the model, a, a, a regression path from one variable to another. So here are some examples of some simple path diagrams that we could represent um, in equation form or using standardized path notation. In this simple diagram we can see that the variable x uh, has a causal effect on y um, and the d term there is the disturbance term so the the error term in this model we could this is essentially a uh, bivariate regression model we could also write this um, in that uh, uh, standard uh, equation notation this second path diagram um, is somewhat more complicated but really is just adding in a second independent variable x2 so again, this is equivalent to a, uh, a multiple linear regression with two independent variables, a dependent variable y, um, and an error term, which in this path diagram is labeled d for the disturbance term. Now, as I mentioned, one of the things that uh, path diagrams, uh, path analysis is particularly useful for um, is for studying not just indirect, not just direct effects, but also indirect effects, we can see now that uh, we've introduced a more complex relationship between these variables where uh, x1 um, has a direct effect on x2 um, but x2 also has a direct effect on y so we now have an indirect effect of x1 on y through x2 and we can use uh, standard formulae to decompose these uh, regression coefficients indicated by beta 1 to beta 3 into the direct, indirect and total components. So here beta 1 represents the direct effect of x1 on y, beta 2 is the direct effect of x1 on x2, beta 3 now is the uh, direct effect of x2 on y and beta 2 times beta 3 will give us the uh, indirect effect of x1 on y and we can also compute from this path diagram the total effect um, which is the sum of the indirect and the, uh, t and the direct effects between one variable and another. So if we take the sum of beta 1 and the product of beta 2 and beta 3 this will give us the total effect of x1 on y. So that's given a very brief overview of both latent variables and 
path analysis and what I'm encouraging you to think about to understand what we're doing with structural equation models is that when we have a path diagram that includes latent variables rather than just observed variables as we can see in this diagram then we're representing a structural equation model. In the first video about structural equation models, uh, I gave some background to uh, what structural equation modelling is, the historical um, paths that led to its development, uh, some of the key ideas and uh, the ways that it can be applied uh, in social science settings. In this video, I'm going to talk about some of the key ideas, terms and concepts in structural equation modelling. This is important because SEM is uh, rather different to other areas of statistics. Uh, some of the ideas that are uh, important in understanding and applying SEMs uh, are quite unfamiliar. Um, and so it's important to have a grounding and a familiarity with these ideas before we move on to other applications. So in this video, I'll be talking about path diagrams, the way that we represent uh, equations and theories uh, in, in the form of diagrams in SEMS. Um, I'll talk about the difference between exogenous and endogenous variables. Uh, I'll talk about the way that structural equation modelling analyses not the raw data but the uh, variance covariance matrix of the, uh, the variables uh, that we're interested in. I'll talk a little bit about how parameters are estimated uh, using maximum likelihood in structural equation modelling um, and I'll also uh, go over how we apply what are called parameter constraints, how we, we don't always estimate uh, every parameter in the model. Some of the parameters are fixed to uh, values uh, before we start fitting the model. I'll also talk about how we assess the overall fit of a model in structural equation models um, and the importance of the idea of what are called nested models for assessing model fit. And I'll also talk a bit about uh, identification of structural equation models. Again, that's something which is linked to model fit and something that we don't uh, encounter so much uh, in uh, regression context that many people are familiar with. So, the first thing um, I'm going to talk about are path diagrams um, and path diagrams is one of the uh, reasons why structural equation modelling is, is very appealing uh, to many social scientists in particular. Um, this is because social scientists don't always have such a, a strong grounding in mathematics and are um, less comfortable with reading um, complex equations and so on. Um, and so uh, path diagrams are another way of presenting the same information as we can get in, a, in an equation, but they do this visually. Uh, and that's often a, a clearer way of seeing uh, what is being presented in an equation compared to uh, Greek letters and symbols and so on. So if we write our path diagrams correctly, then we can read directly between an equation uh, and a path diagram. They tell us exactly the same thing. So in this example here, um, we could write a bivariate regression equation in the usual way wh where our dependent variable y is a function of our independent variable x um, and we are going to uh, solve this equation using data and we're going to uh, solve for the unknown parameter beta. What is the relationship between um, x and y? Now we can we can also write that same information down in the form of a path diagram, a simple path diagram uh, in this case. So we have here uh, y is now represented as a rectangle, um, x is also a, a rectangle, we have an arrow running from uh, x to y in a single direction and we have uh, a, a small circle pointing into y uh, which represents the error term in the uh, equation. And you can see there that there's a, a, a b above the line to indicate that the, uh, the parameter represented by the, the, the straight 
uh, single arrow is a regression coefficient. And this is quite clear, I think, visually in the sense that what the model is implying at least is that B, that X causes Y and that there is some uh, coefficient beta which uh, uh, summarizes what that causal effect is. And there is an, an error term in that equation. Um, there are conventions for, um, for path diagrammatic not notation so that we use it consistently. Um, there are some uh, variations in, in how uh, different conventions are applied and so on, but this is the, the, the general form um, where we have a, uh, a latent variable is represented in the form of, a, of an ellipse. Um, an observed variable, some, a variable that we've actually measured in our data set directly, would be represented as in the last slide using a, a rectangle. Um, error variances are, are small circles and this, this, sh this is uh, similar to a measured latent variable, it's a circular form but it's actually a small circle now and this, this uh, indicates that uh, these error terms are also latent variables but we don't actually label them, these are kind of unknown um, or residual uh, latent variables. We also uh, indicate the relationships between variables using um, lines with arrows. A curved arrow with a, 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 a sorry, a curved line with a double an arrow at each end indicates a, a covariance between two variables. We call this sometimes a non-directional path or an unanalyzed relationship because this is used to show that two variables are related to one another, but our model does not. Um, specify anything about uh, the direction of that relationship. It may be because it's not an important part of the theory but we know that the two variables are uh, associated. Lastly, a, uh, a straight line with a single arrow at one end indicates a, a directional path, a regression uh, coefficient. So we're, we're saying if we use a, uh, a single uh, headed arrow then we are indicating the direction of the relationship between two variables in our model. And we can put these uh, basic symbols together to form more uh, complex models, but ones which have a clear meaning and which can indeed be translated back into uh, the uh, standard uh, equation notation. Um, here are some examples of some quite simple uh, uh, path diagrams. Um, here we're just looking at uh, measurement models. These are uh, confirmatory factor models and we have here eta1 uh, which is a latent variable shown as an ellipse um, and eta1 here is shown to, uh, to cause three observed variables x1 to x3. And we can also think of that as, as eta1, the latent variable, being measured by uh, the observed variables x1 to x3. Um, and then at the top of the diagram we have three error variances, uh, E1 to E3. So those are the errors for each of those uh, equations that eta1 is predicting x1 with some error, uh, it's predicting x2 with some error and so on. So that's a, a, a simple path diagram for a, a factor model um, and that could be written um, as an equation but we are in this instance using a path diagram. We can extend this to make a slightly more complicated path diagram. Now we have two latent variables, eta1 and eta2. They're essentially the same uh, diagram as we saw in the previous slide, but now we have two latent variables. And we have uh, six observed variables, six variables in rectangles, each one of which has an error term. Now we've also added in here a, uh, a curved line with uh, an arrow at each end. This is to show that the, in our model, the uh, two latent variables are correlated with one another. We're not saying anything about uh, the direction of the relationship between eta1 and eta2. We're just saying that we think that there is some kind of relationship between them. In this path diagram, we've uh, now introduced a, a theoretical statement about the direction of the relationship between eta1 and eta2. So we no longer have this curved arrow, uh, but we have a straight line with an arrow at one end. So what we're saying here is that 
uh, eta 2 uh, is a cause of eta 1. Um, and this again would be similar to the, uh, the first diagram that we saw, a bivariate uh, relationship, a bivariate regression with eta 1 regressed on, on eta 2 and we would then solve for uh, the unknown uh, beta coefficient uh, above the, the, the straight line uh, with the arrow at the end. Um, but as I said, this is now uh, a bivariate regression of a latent variable onto another latent variable. When we uh, are uh, building path diagrams and, and, and systems of, of equations, um, we, in structured equation modelling, we need to distinguish between two important kinds of variables, um, exogenous variables and endogenous variables. Now, an endogenous variable, as the name suggests, is, is something which uh, is caused within the system. It's a variable that has, if you like, an arrow pointing into it. It is a dependent variable uh, in one or more equations. An exogenous variable, on the other hand, um, is uh, akin to uh, an independent variable in that terminology. It's a variable that um, is not caused by anything within the system of equations that we are presenting as our as our SEM. Uh, that doesn't mean to say that we, uh, we believe that exogenous variables are in some senses not caused by any other variables. Um, it's simply that within our, uh, our own model, uh, the variables in the model, it doesn't have any uh, direct cause. Now an important uh, part of SEM is that uh, variables can be both exogenous and endogenous. Um, so we can have uh, a, an arrow pointing into a variable, uh, making it endogenous, and that variable itself can have an arrow pointing at another variable, making it an exogenous variable in, uh, in that limited sense, although it's a, now a different kind of, uh, of variable because it has uh, an arrow both pointing into it and an arrow coming out of it. And that's important because that kind of variable is a mediating variable. It's a variable which, uh, through which another uh, variable has an effect on, on a third variable. In this path diagram, uh, we can, which we've already seen, but this path diagram now we can distinguish what kinds of uh, variables these are. We've got two exogenous latent variables here. They're exogenous latent variables because uh, there is no directional path uh, pointing into either of them. Neither of them, therefore, has an error term. This is just a correlation that we're seeing here. So these are, are both exogenous in the model. Um, again, we've seen this path diagram. Um, we've got uh, a, a new distinction that we can apply to it now, though, uh, that eta1 is endogenous and eta2 is exogenous. Eta2 uh, doesn't have any uh, direct paths going into it. It doesn't have an error term. Um, whereas eta1 has an error term pointing into it because it's got a directional path running from eta2. So, um, a fundamental uh, advantage of using structural equation models is this ability to represent our theories um, as uh, diagrams um, rather than using uh, uh, notation which many social scientists are less comfortable with. Another, uh, if you like, unusual feature of, uh, of SEM um, is that um, in the uh, conventional uh, practice anyway, uh, we don't analyse uh, the raw data of the observed variables, uh, but we analyse the variance-covariance matrix, which we'll denote S, of those observed variables. Now, this is kind of unusual uh, and, and somewhat surprising, I think, to people when they first come across it, that um, all the data that we uh, need is just the, uh, the, the set of uh, covariances and variances of the uh, observed variables. Um, as we shall see in later videos, um, some structured equation models also use the, the means of the observed variables in addition to their uh, variance-covariance matrix. Um, so, what, what are we doing with this, uh, uh, this variance-covariance matrix? Well, uh, in broad terms, um, we are trying to summarise S, the variance-covariance matrix of the observed variables, by specifying a simpler 
underlying structure. Um, so we're going to uh, specify a, a, a model which is in some ways simpler than uh, simply reproducing S. Um, and our model, our SEM in this sense, the simpler underlying structure, um, will uh, yield an implied variance covariance matrix. What I mean there is that uh, if our model is true, uh, then the variance covariance matrix that we observe should look like this. It should have uh, uh, th these numbers in uh, each of the cells. Um, and again, as we'll see uh, later, this uh, implied matrix can be compared to the one that we've actually observed. Uh, and that comparison, if it's uh, uh, done properly, can tell us something useful uh, about uh, how well our, our model is accounting for the data. To the extent that the implied and the observed matrices differ, then our theory, our structural equation model, um, is not doing a very good job of, 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 of telling us how this uh, data were, uh, were generated. So um, a variance-covariance matrix, probably most people will be more familiar with a, a correlation matrix, but uh, here we're uh, dealing with unstandardized variables and um, this matrix shows uh, six observed variables, x1 to x6, um, and uh, they are in both the columns and in the rows of this table. Um, and the diagonal, um, which is shown in bold, uh, indicates the variance. Um, so uh, uh, the, the covariance of a variable with itself, in this case maybe x1 and x1, that gives us the variance of that variable. So a covariance of a, a variance with itself is its variance, and those are shown in bold on the main diagonal. Then we see in the other cells the covariances, uh, which can be negative uh, or positive uh, in the other cells of this matrix. And you'll observe that the, uh, the top part of the matrix is uh, redundant with the bottom part. So we actually only need uh, the lower part of this, uh, of this matrix. Now, an important aspect of, of any uh, model fitting, and structured equation modelling is, is, is no different, is uh, the need to uh, estimate what the unknown parameters in our models are. Um, the, the betas, what is the, uh, what is the relationship between ETA1 and ETA2 in the population? Now, there are different ways of, 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 of uh, estimating these parameters um, in uh, standard regression modelling, we would use uh, ordinary least squares. Um, in structural equation modelling, practice is uh, mainly around using a technique called uh, maximum likelihood. Um, and maximum likelihood estimates the unknown model parameters by maximising the likelihood, which we can denote L, of a particular uh, sample of data. Now, L is, uh, the, the likelihood, is a, a mathematical function which is based on the joint probability of continuous sample observations. So, um, in essence, maximum likelihood uh, finds what the maximum value of L is for a particular sample of data, um, and it does that by sort of iterating through using different uh, values for the unknown parameters until it finds the maximum likelihood. Once that maximum has been found, then we have produced the, the maximum likelihood estimates for the unknown parameters. Now, maximum likelihood uh, it has, it is appealing because it is uh, unbiased and efficient. Um, now, what those terms mean are that uh, if we have a large sample, um, then our estimates of the unknown parameters will be correct. They will converge upon uh, the true values in the population. They're e efficient in the sense that no other way of doing this will give us uh, more precise estimates of those parameters. Um, now those, those two assumptions of being unbiased and, and efficient um, do themselves hinge on some other assumptions. Um, one important one is that the, uh, the data come from a multivariate normal distribution. Um, 
essentially that requires us to be using continuous variables. So maximum likelihood uh, is less good when we have variables in our data set uh, that, we, that are not continuous and that we have arrows pointing into. In those situations, we need to use uh, different estimators. But for now, I'll be focusing on the simpler case of multivariate normal data and uh, maximum likelihood. Um, now, another way in which maximum likelihood is uh, used in SEM um, is that not just in the estimation of the unknown parameters, but in use of the, uh, the likelihood, the maximum likelihood. Um, if we take the, the log of the likelihood for the, for the model, then we can use this to test how well our model fits compared to some uh, more or less restrictive alternative. So maximum likelihood uh, is used in, in two ways in SEM. One is for estimation of the unknown parameters um, and linked to that is uh, use of the, the, the log likelihood uh, to assess the way, how well the model fits the observed data. Most areas of statistics that social scientists are uh, familiar with, um, the focus is very much on estimating the unknown parameters in the model. We want to know what the, uh, the relationship between X and Y is in the population, or possibly what the conditional uh, association between two variables um, is. And so we, we focus on estimating those unknown parameters. This is also true, of course, in SEM, but in SEM we have an additional uh, focus, which is on fixing or constraining parameters to particular values bef before we uh, estimate our model. And that's a bit unusual for many people. So um, we, we can fix model parameters to any values, but uh, it tends to be the case that we will be uh, fixing parameters to be uh, the value 0 uh, or the value 1. Those are the most common uh, parameter constraints that we make in, in SEM, and I'll come back to uh, why we do that later. Um, but we can also, uh, in addition to fixing parameters to these values, we can also constrain uh, model parameters to be equal to other model parameters. So we will uh, still estimate those uh, equivalized parameters, but they have to be uh, estimated so that they are the same. The model uh, applies that constraint on uh, what the parameters are that are estimated. So again, that's something which is quite unusual and we don't really see that in uh, many other uh, statistical techniques that we might uh, use in social science. The, the main thing that we uh, are, are using these parameter constraints for is for the purposes of model identification. And I will be saying some more about that soon. Now I said that we can use uh, the, uh, the likelihood of our model um, to test uh, how well it fits the data by comparing our model with another model. Um, now when we do this, the, the two models that we compare have to be what is called nested, one within the other. Um, so what do we mean by, by nested? Well, it is, it's precisely this, that, that one model is a subset of the other, or the parameters in, in one model are a subset of the parameters in the other model. Another way of saying this is that if we have two models, A and B, then model A is the same as model B, but it just adds some additional parameter restrictions. So A is B plus parameter restrictions. To take an example here then, um, if model B has the form Y equals A plus B to 1 X1 plus B to 2 X2 plus E, then model A will be nested if it has that same structure but it applies a parameter constraint to the two beta coefficients that they are equal. So we now have this property that model A is the same as model B with an added 
parameter constraint. It is therefore nested within model B. If we consider a, a third model, model C though, and we now remove x2 from the model and we add uh, z2 instead, then model C is not nested within model B because it isn't just model B plus some parameter restrictions. It has a new variable z which is not uh, in model B. So these are, if you like, uh, apple and pear models. We, 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 we can't really, uh, in any sensible way, make comparisons uh, between the, the, the fit of model B and of model C because they include uh, different variables. So, I've said something about model fit already and the fact that it's based on the log of the likelihood of the model that we've estimated um, and that we can do this comparison of model fit when the two models are nested. Um, this is because if we take the, the log of the likelihood for model A uh, from the likelihood for model B, or the log of the likelihood, then that is itself, that number is itself distributed as chi-square. Um, and the chi-square distribution then has a degree of freedom uh, which is equal to the, the difference in the degrees of freedom for model A and model B. We can therefore use this chi-square distribution to test the fit of, the, of the, the first model to the second model. Now, if our value of chi-square has a p-value uh, greater than 0 0.05, um, then we will prefer the more parsimonious model, model A. Because what we're saying here, in this situation, is that the, the models are not different with regard to one another's likelihood values. That We, we say that the, the likelihoods are uh, essentially uh, the same. Um, that means that we will prefer the model that, has, uh, that is simpler and is estimating fewer parameters. So where in this case that, that model B would be our uh, observed data, the variance covariance matrix, then we're saying that there, there is no difference between the observed and the implied uh, matrices and our model therefore fits the data well. So that's the, the essence of uh, the assessment of model fit using chi-square in structural equation models. We can uh, look at the, uh, the difference in the likelihood for one model and compare it to the likelihood for uh, a, a nested model and make a a statistical test of whether one fits the data better than the other. So the last thing I'm going to talk about in this video is model identification. Uh, this is all linked with uh, the things I've talked about already uh, to parameter constraints and, and fixing parameters to particular values and to assessing model fit and so on. So what is model identification? Well uh, in conceptual terms, um, we need to have enough known pieces of information in an equation uh, to produce unique estimates of unknown parameters. Now we need unique estimates, um, otherwise we don't know which ones uh, to prefer. So um, to give an example uh, of what we mean here by the balance between uh, known and unknown pieces of information, if we look at these two equations, the first of these is uh, unidentified. We have x plus 2y equals 7. So what we would want to do is to find the unique value uh, that satisfies uh, that equation uh, for y. Now, um, because we have um, a balance of knowns and unknowns where uh, x and y could really take on many, many, many different values and they would all be uh, uh, true, if you like, in terms of the, the equation being correct, that equation is unidentified because it doesn't enable us to uh, produce unique estimates. Now, if we change that equation slightly, where we, we, we now are not having x as an unknown and we make that 3, um, then um, we can only have one value for y, which is 2, um, in a way that will satisfy that equation.
So that equation then is, is identified. Um, now, uh, that is the, the essence of uh, what we uh, need to understand about identification, is that it's to do with the, the balance between um, the, uh, the number of known and unknown pieces of information um, in an equation. Now, um, there is something else to know about identification, which is that it's a, a theoretical property of the model. Um, it's not really linked to, uh, to the data as such, so we can, we can figure out what the uh, identification status of a particular model is uh, without having any, any data or estimating any parameters. Um, but um, it's also true to say that a, a model can be theoretically identified um, but empirically unidentified given a particular set of data. So um, we are looking at the balance between the known and the unknown pieces of information in our, in our equations um, and in SEM the known pieces of information are the variances and covariances and means, if we're using means in our model, of the observed variables. We, we, these are the known pieces of information. The unknown pieces of information are the parameters that we want to estimate uh, in the model. Now, models can have different identification status. Um, a model can have, uh, as we saw a moment ago, uh, more unknowns than knowns. That means that it's unidentified. We can't produce unique uh, values uh, for the unknown parameters. So that's an unknown, uh, an unidentified uh, model. Other models can be just identified where the number of knowns is equal to the number of unknowns. We don't have any uh, what we call over-identifying uh, uh, restrictions on the model. Um, and therefore, we, in, in, for, for just identified models, we don't have any likelihood for the model that we can use uh, to assess its fit. Now, most of the models that people are, uh, are familiar with using, again, ordinary least squares regression, those kinds of models are uh, just identified. Um, the third level of st identification status is over-identified models, and that's usually what we are uh, trying to uh, get to um, and deal with in SEM, and that's where the, the number of knowns um, is greater than the uh, number of unknown parameters in the model. And that means that we can uh, assess the, uh, the fit of the model um, as well as estimating the unknown parameters. So, there are different ways that we can um, assess the identification status uh, of a model. Uh, a very simple one these days with uh, modern computers is simply to uh, to run our model uh, and uh, most software will uh, tell us uh, what the identification status is of the model even before we fit the data. So it's quite easy uh, compared to how things were done in the past uh, but nonetheless it, it's still useful to uh, to have a consideration of the uh, identification status of a model uh, as it helps us to understand uh, where things might be going wrong if we have a problem and we, uh, we, 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 our model is unidentified, uh, working through it in this way can, can help us to see why. So um, here's the uh, accounting rule that can be used where if we uh, have uh, S as the number of observed variables in the model um, and the number of non-redundant uh, parameters um, is given by this equation which is a half of S uh, times s plus 1, again s is the number of observed variables, um, and t um, is the number of parameters that we are going to estimate in the model, the number of unknown parameters. So if t um, is greater than uh, the uh, answer to this equation, um, then our model is unidentified, we have more unknown parameters than we have non-redundant parameters, and if it's less uh, then we have an over-identified model. So, to give an example of that, um, here is the path diagram that we saw earlier where we have eta1, uh, a latent variable, which is uh, measured by or causing three observed variables and uh, each of those observed variables has an error variance. 
So uh, if we want to uh, find the number of non-redundant parameters, we can use our half s uh, times s plus 1 uh, equation. Now we have s here is equal to 3, so s times uh, s plus 1 is 3 times 4, that's 12. If we take half of that, it gives us 6 as the number of non-redundant parameters. Now, how many parameters are we trying to estimate with this model? Well, uh, three variances, one for each error term. Uh, we've got two factor loadings. One of them you'll see there is uh, constrained to one. Um, so we're fixing that loading um, and that is uh, uh, for identification of the model. So we're, we're not estimating that factor loading, um, but we are estimating the other two. So we have two factor loadings. And then lastly, we have uh, a variance for the latent variable. So 3 plus 2 plus 1 uh, is six parameters to be estimated, which is the same as the, the number of non-redundant parameters. So we have, with this model, zero degrees of freedom. The model is just identified. So we can estimate the unknown parameters, but we do not have any way of assessing uh, the, the fit of this model because it's just identified, no degrees of freedom. Now, something else that's uh, important to understand about identification is that uh, we, as the, the, the analyst, can control, uh, uh, to some degree, the identification status of our model. So we can, uh, we can do this um, for a, a model like the one that we just saw that's just identified or a model that's under-identified by adding more known pieces of information to the equation. Or, uh, by removing some unknown pieces of uh, information, removing uh, uh, parameters that are to be estimated and adding constraints. So um, if we were to uh, constrain two of the parameters in the model to be equal to one another, let's say we constrain two of the, 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 the regression coefficients or the factor loadings to be equal, um, now we're only estimating one parameter, where previously we were estimating two. So we've removed one unknown and gained one degree of freedom. Now we can see this uh, in this model here, um, where we have added an additional observed variable to the previous path diagram. So now the model is essentially the same, but we've got a fourth observed variable, x4. Um, we now are, are, are estimating um, an additional factor loading and an additional error variance, but we have uh, gained uh, more in terms of our uh, known parameters. So now if we use our half s times s plus 1 equation, um, s is now 4, so 4 times s plus 1, 4 times 5 is 20, we take half of that, um, now we have 10 non-redundant parameters in this model um, and we have 4 plus 3 plus 1 parameters to be estimated, 8. So 10 minus 8 gives us 2 degrees of freedom. So by adding that fourth um, observed variable, our model is, is now over-identified and we can say something about the fit of uh, that model to the, uh, uh, to the variance covariance matrix that we've observed. So in that example, uh, we changed the identification status of our model by adding in uh, more known, another known piece of information, another observed variable. Another way of uh, changing the identification status is to remove unknown parameters. Now, here in this example, we are now not estimating the two uh, factor loadings that we were in the first example. So we, you can see there's a number one next to each of the uh, arrows for the factor loadings. So rather than estimating those, we're saying these are all equal. Now, this may not be a, a very theoretically meaningful thing to do. This isn't the point um, at this particular juncture. What we're showing here is that uh, you can change the identification status of the model by removing unknown. So we're not estimating these anymore. So we still have six non-redundant parameters, but we now are only estimating four unknown parameters because we uh, are not estimating any of the factor loading. So now this model is over-identified.
So, in this video, I have uh, covered some of the uh, important ideas and concepts uh, that learners will need to take with them into uh, later uh, videos and applications. These are uh, focused around the use of path diagrams for representing our theories and, and our equations, the fact that we uh, analyze the variance covariance matrix of the observed variables rather than uh, the raw data, uh, that we use uh, for the most part maximum likelihood estimation um, which has some re quite restrictive assumptions about multivariate normality but nonetheless is a, a, a very useful uh, estimator. Um, it gives us uh, consistent, unbiased and efficient estimates of the unknown model parameters and allows us to uh, do global tests of the fit of the model to uh, our data. Um, those kinds of uh, fit tests are mainly applicable in the context where models are nested, where we can say that uh, uh, one model is a subset of uh, a second model, that it is the same as the second model with some additional parameter restrictions. Um, and I've talked about identification of models and models that can be uh, under-identified, uh, just identified and over identified and how we as the, uh, the analyst can exert some control uh, over the identification status of our model by removing unknown parameters or adding in more known parameters. In the first two videos on structural equation models, I've covered some of the sort of conceptual background, the history, some of the key ideas. Um, in this video, we move to uh, understanding some of the uh, applications, some of the actual model fitting that goes on uh, in structural equation modeling. Uh, and this focuses uh, particularly on confirmatory factor analysis. So in this video, I'm going to uh, talk about the, the general idea of how we measure uh, concepts using latent variables um, and uh, I'm going to contrast uh, two approaches to using latent variables to measure concepts. The first is uh, the more uh, conventional or historically uh, the, the, the main way of doing this using exploratory factor analysis. Um, and I'm going to contrast this then with the more modern approach of uh, confirmatory factor analysis. Um, I'll then uh, move on to talking about uh, some of the, uh, the ways that we go about uh, actually fitting and, and estimating uh, confirmatory factor models uh, and some of the, uh, the important uh, procedures that we have to do. Um, and I'm going to finish off by uh, talking about some of the kind of extensions uh, that we can take uh, CFA into, uh, notably when we are uh, modeling the uh, means of latent variables as well as their, uh, their relationships, their associations. Um, I'll talk about the difference between formative and reflective uh, indicators in CFA, um, a procedure called item parceling. Um, and also the situation uh, which we may sometimes be interested in of, of, of fitting a factor model to uh, variables which are themselves latent variables uh, rather than to observed variables which is the usual case and uh, that would be called a, a higher order uh, factor model. So um, in the first video I gave a, a, a sort of pithy definition of uh, structural equation modelling as being path analysis with latent variables. Um, we can also think of this as really being a distinction between two stages uh, or, or two parts of the modelling process. The first is where we want to get good measures of our concepts or our constructs. Um, and then the second part is uh, looking at the relationships between those measured constructs. So there's a, a if you like, uh, uh, the emphasis firstly on measurement and measurement accuracy and adequacy uh, and then secondly uh, moving on to look at the, the structural relationships between 
uh, the constructs that we've measured. So again, we saw in the first video um, that any time we want to measure something um, in, in science, and particularly in social science, um, is that the, uh, the measurements contain various kinds of error. Uh, that, that error can be uh, random and or systematic. Um, so what we want to do in our uh, uh, statistical approach to the data is to isolate um, the true score in a variable um, and remove the error. And this is really what we're trying to do uh, using latent variables for, for, for measurement. So we want to uh, decompose our x variables. x is what we've actually measured. Um, and we can uh, decompose that into the t and the e components. The t is the, the true score um, and the e is the error. Um, and we, we need some kind of model to enable us to, to split the x into these t and e components. Now one uh, quite straightforward and useful way of doing this is simply to, uh, to add uh, the scores across a number of different x variables. If we have, say, four variables which are all measuring uh, the same underlying concept, then we could just add those up and take a, a, a summed score. Now this has, has some benefits um, because the, the random error in each of those measurements uh, will, will cancel out as we uh, add items together. Um, but it's, it's a rather unsophisticated approach and in particular um, it gives equal weight to each item um, in the construction of the, uh, the true score. Um, and that's often something that we, we don't want to do. So in another approach is to actually estimate some kind of a latent variable model. Now, um, in understanding the ways that we do this in um, SEM, it's useful to sort of go back uh, in history, if you like, and think about a, uh, an earlier approach to estimating latent variables. Now this isn't to say that exploratory factor analysis is no longer used, of course it is, um, but the, uh, the more modern procedure of, of confirmatory factor analysis has some uh, attractive properties, shall we say, compared to uh, EFA. So the exploratory factor model is also referred to as the unrestricted uh, factor model or an unrestricted factor analysis because, as we'll see when we get to looking at CFA, CFA does place restrictions um, on the, uh, the variance-covariance matrix, whereas EFA doesn't do this. EFA, or uh, principal components analysis, is a, a similar technique, um, finds the, the factor loadings which best reproduce the correlations that are observed between the observed variables in our model. So let's say that we have uh, six uh, questionnaire items that all measure more or less the same thing. They're intended to measure some, uh, some concept that we're interested in. Um, a, 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 an EFA will simply kind of reorder the data uh, in a way which uh, has uh, best accounted for the uh, observed correlations between those variables. Now, it does this in a way of producing um, a number of, of factors uh, which are in EFA equal to the number of observed variables that we have. So this is really just a, a reordering of the observed data. Um, we end up with the same number of factors as we have observed variables. So at this point, in just this reordering, um, EFA hasn't done very much in, in way of summarising, of simplifying, which is often uh, what we're trying to do um, uh, with a, a, a latent variable model. So we have the same number of factors as we have observed variables, and all the variables uh, in our model, the observed variables, are allowed to uh, be correlated with all of the factors. Now, we need to get from this point of having the same number of uh, factors as observed variables to retaining a, a smaller number, so that we're doing some job of summarising uh, rather than just 
uh, transforming the uh, observed relationships. And there are different rules for doing this. Um, one kind of heuristic judgment would be to keep or retain um, a, a number of factors which is less than the number of uh, observed variables that explain some satisfactory amount of the observed variance. So we might say we'll retain as many factors uh, as are needed to explain 70% of the uh, variability or the correlations between the observed variables. Um, something else that we have to do in, in addition to, to summarising is to understand what the, the factors that are produced by the, the factor analysis, what they mean, what are they uh, measuring. Um, now we do this um, by looking at the pattern of factor loadings between the factor and the observed variables. So uh, we do this in a sort of inductive way. We, we work out what the factors are by looking at how they are related to the observed variables. Um, another thing about uh, exploratory factor analysis is that um, there is no unique solution where, where we have more than one factor um, and so uh, we can rotate the axes of our solution um, in ways that can help us to see uh, what the, uh, the underlying structure is and so rotation of uh, axes in, in, in uh, exploratory factor analysis is uh, quite common. Now to give an example of uh, what I mean by uh, some of those previous points, here's some, some made up data um, and we have uh, nine observed items um, and these are if you like, knowledge quiz items that have been administered to a, uh, a sample of children and um, what we're measuring is some construct like intelligence or cognitive ability. Now if we uh, were to apply an EFA or a principal components analysis uh, to this data um, then we would initially have uh, nine components or factors which is the same number as uh, the observed uh, items. So the first thing that we would need to do would be to uh, implement some uh, judgment about how many factors to retain. Now in this case you can see that Four, three factors have been uh, retained in this model and that may have been based on one of these uh, heuristic guides around amount of variance explained or some kind of uh, plot, like a scree plot. Um, so once we've, we've done that we want to know what each of these three factors is actually measuring um, and we do that by looking at the pattern of correlations and that's what are uh, in the, uh, the rows and columns of this table um, between each factor and, each, uh, and, and the set of items. So if we look first at, at, at factor one, we can see that these, the, the, the factor loadings or the correlations are high between factor one and the observed items which are measuring mathematical ability. Um, so this is saying that if you have a high score, the higher your score on factor one, the more likely you are to get the item math one correct. There's a high correlation between your score on the factor and your uh, score on the item. For factor two, there are high loadings on uh, the visual spatial items and low loadings on the uh, other items and for factor three we see uh, this other pattern where it's the verbal uh, items that have a, uh, a high score and low scores on the other. So we, we, we do this inductive process of figuring out what the factors are measuring by looking at the correlations between the factors uh, and the observed variables once we've uh, retained uh, a smaller number that we think is in some ways satisfactory. So um, this is a, a very useful procedure and has been widely used uh, in social science for many decades but it does have some uh, limitations. Um, firstly EFA is an inductive, it's rather a theoretical procedure and that is uh, something which in general uh, we uh, are less happy with in terms of the way that we build theory in uh, quantitative social science. So um, we've got a situation where the, the data is telling us what our theory should be when 
Generally, we would prefer to do that the other way round. We would have a theory and test it against the data. Another uh, unattractive property of EFA and similar techniques is that it, it relies on uh, subjective judgment and heuristic rules about what's a, a, a large amount of variability to explain and, and, and so on. So there, there's a lot of room for subjectivity in determining uh, what our uh, model should be. And of course, when we uh, are analysing data of this nature, um, where we have indicators of uh, underlying concepts, it's rarely the case that we have no theory at all about which uh, concepts the different indicators are actually measuring. We've usually written the questionnaire indeed uh, with a specific intention of measuring particular concepts. So actually um, the, the, the more uh, realistic and accurate uh, assessment of what's going on here is that we're starting with a theory and then we're uh, assessing it against the data that we've collected. So the idea that we uh, are going from the data to the theory is not generally an accurate representation of how this procedure actually works. So given that that is the case, given that we, we do have a theory about how the, uh, the indicators are related to the uh, concepts, it's better to be explicit about that from the outset and then use statistical tests of those theories of measurement um, against the, 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 the sample data that we've collected. So we can compare this approach of exploratory factor analysis with a confirmatory approach. Um, so confirmatory factor analysis is also referred to as the restricted factor model because unlike EFA it places uh, restrictions on the uh, parameters of the model. Uh, it can't be therefore rotated. Um, you can't rotate the solution, there is only one uh, unique solution for the, the CFA. Um, and the key difference now uh, with uh, CFA to EFA is that uh, we specify our measurement model before uh, we've looked at our data. Um, and this is sometimes referred to as the, the no peaking rule. Um, if we have a theory uh, about how the indicators are uh, related to our concepts, then we should set that down a priori as our theory and then test it against the data rather than tweaking our theory um, as a function of the particular sample data that we happen to have. So when we do things in this way, in a confirmatory way, uh, the key kinds of questions that we have to answer are uh, which indicators measure or cause which, or, or are caused by which factors. Which indicators measure uh, or are caused by which factors. And importantly, and this is the real distinction with EFA, is which indicators are unrelated to uh, which factors. Remember in an EFA we say that uh, every uh, variable is related in some way, is allowed to correlate with uh, every factor. Um, in CFA that isn't the case. We will say that the correlations or the covariances between some of the indicators and some of the factors is zero. We'll make that uh, as a, uh, a parameter restriction. And we will also need to answer questions about the correlations between uh, the factors rather than leaving that as a default assumption in the model. Here we have six observed variables, x1 to x6. Um, now the first part of the model will have produced uh, six factors or components. So at this stage we've already retained just the two factors that we think uh, explain enough of the, the variability uh, between our observed variables. But what you also see here still is that um, there is a, a single-headed arrow running from each of the, uh, the two latent variables, eta1 and eta2, to all six of the observed variables. So there is a, uh, we are estimating a correlation uh, between each factor and each of the uh, uh, observed variables. Now what we would be looking for in this kind of situation is that um, some of those loadings would be large and some of them would be close to zero. So if we look at uh, ETA1 for example, 
we might, in an EFA context, hope that the uh, or expect that the the loadings between eta one and x one to x three would be high of say 0.7 or above in standardized form, or and that the loadings that run from eta one to x four to x six would be close to zero, and the opposite would apply for eta two. So what we're doing there is, I say, estimating all of those uh, relationships and expecting some pattern of, of, of high and low loadings between them. By way of contrast, the, the same uh, variables uh, and the same two factors now in the form of a confirmatory factor model, now rather than uh, having uh, estimates for all of those uh, relationships between eta1 and uh, x1 to x6 and eta2 and x1 to x6, we say that there is no relationship between eta1 and x4 to x6. There's no uh, arrow pointing from eta1 to uh, any of those observed variables. And the same for eta2. There's no uh, arrows pointing at x1 to x3. So the fact that there isn't an arrow there means that in our uh, model we are constraining those to zero. We're not just estimating them and saying, are they nearly zero? We are specifying our model a priori to say that those paths are indeed zero. So those are the kinds of parameter constraints and parameter restrictions that I was referring to and talking about in video two, that it's quite unusual in other branches of statistics that we use in social science to make these constraints and, and, and fix parameters to uh, particular values. But that's why we call the confirmatory model uh, the restricted factor model, because we place restrictions on the loadings. So um, sometimes, as I just uh, gave an example of, we would fix particular parameters to, to zero for indicators that do not measure or do not influence um, a, uh, a measured variable. And the important thing to understand is that our theory of the, the measurement of our concepts, how we think the uh, concepts are related to the indicators that we've uh, selected and, 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 and written, if they're a questionnaire item, um, that that theory is expressed in the constraints that we place on the model. So we're not just estimating everything, but we are placing restrictions on what the parameters, uh, the values that the parameters can take. And those uh, restrictions, those fixing of parameters, they over-identify the model. So we are uh, placing restrictions which give us uh, more degrees of freedom in our model, which enable us, in turn, to test the fit of our model compared to the uh, the, the matrix that we've actually observed, S, the, the, the sample uh, variance covariance matrix. Another way that we uh, apply um, restrictions uh, to, the, to the parameters in a confirmatory factor model um, is to give the latent variables a metric. Now, what I mean by that is that if we have a, a measured variable, we will have specified some kind of uh, scale uh, for respondents to answer on. So maybe it will be uh, strongly agree is the value 1 and strongly disagree is the value 5. So the scale uh, is 1 to 5 for that measured variable. For a latent variable, um, we don't have any uh, metric. It is a, an unobserved variable. It's a hypothetical variable. So uh, it doesn't have uh, a, a metric um, on its own. We have to give it one. And there are two ways that this can be done. Um, the first is to essentially produce a standardized solution so that all variables are measured in standard deviation units. This can be done by constraining the variance of the latent variable uh, to one. Um, and this has uh, some benefits, but the the downside, of course, is that we no longer have an unstandardized solution. If we, if we uh, require all latent variables to be measured in standard deviation units, then they don't have any 
uh, retention of the, uh, uh, the unstandardized metric that they could be uh, uh, given. So the second approach um, is to constrain one of the factor loadings to take the value one. Um, and by doing this, um, we take the, uh, the scale from that particular item, which we'll call the reference item. So if we fix the factor loading uh, of a particular item to one, then that will be the reference item and the latent variable will have the same scale as that item. So if it's measured again on a one to five scale of strongly agree to strongly disagree, then the latent variable will be on a, uh, a scale of one to five. If it's a, uh, a one to 10 scale, the latent variable will be uh, on that same scale. Now, this is generally uh, preferred uh, to the first approach of uh, having a fully standardized solution because we can also get a standardized solution uh, using uh, the, the second approach of fixing one loading to the value one and we also get the, the standardized solution uh, in that approach as well. So um, in confirmatory factor analysis um, we are uh, interested in uh, making good measures of our uh, key constructs, concepts in our theories um, and we are then in this, the next stage usually going to uh, move on and look at the relationships between the, the, the measured concepts. Um, and so conventional SEM is focused on that, the, the structural model, the relationships between concepts. Um, so we are not so interested in the means of the observed or the latent variables. Um, and in, as I say, the conventional way of doing SEM, that isn't a focus. The, the focus is on uh, covariances and correlations, relationships between the variables. But there are occasions uh, within uh, a, a, a SEM context where we would be interested in the means of latent variables. Uh, there are two main areas where we would want to estimate latent means. The first is where uh, we want to see uh, whether there are differences between groups on a latent variable um, and secondly uh, if we're interested in change over time perhaps uh, if we've got a longitudinal data set we would want to uh, estimate the mean of the latent variable and see whether that is uh, changing over time. So when we introduce means into our uh, CFA um, then we do this by adding a constant to the model. Actually, um, when you fit models in modern SEM software, um, this isn't a choice that the analyst has to make. It is, if you like, done uh, underneath the hood. But this is the process that is, is actually implemented, uh, is to add a, a constant which has the value, the same value one, for all cases uh, in the model. Now, the regression of a, of a variable on a predictor and a constant uh, will give us the mean of that variable uh, in the unstandardized beta of that uh, regression. And the mean of an observed variable um, is the, the total effect of a constant on that variable. So that the, the total effect, um, as we saw in video one, is the sum of the indirect and the direct uh, effects. So if we now introduce a constant, which in uh, path diagrammatic notation is represented as a triangle, and here we have the, the number one inside the triangle to indicate that the constant is one, then we, in this path diagram, have again a y variable and an x variable. Uh, we have a direct effect from the constant uh, to y, which has the coefficient a, we have a direct effect from uh, the constant to x, which is b, and a direct effect from x to y, which is c. So the indirect effect of uh, the constant on y is the product of b and c. So by adding in this constant, we can estimate the mean of x, which is simply the, uh, the, the coefficient b, uh, and we can estimate the mean of y uh, by taking the sum of a and the product of b and c. That's the total effect 
the sum of the direct and the indirect effects. So that's how we introduce uh, means into our model. Um, now, if we've added uh, a mean structure in, then we will require some uh, additional uh, identification restrictions because we've, we're now trying to estimate more unknown parameters. That's the, the latent means. Um, so there is a question then about uh, how we uh, estimate and, and compare one mean to another. And the way we do this is by having uh, multiple groups. So where we have uh, more than one group in our sample, then we can fix the, uh, the mean of a latent variable uh, in, in one of those groups to be zero. And then the means of the, uh, the remaining groups on that latent variable are estimated as differences from the reference group. So with uh, mean models in CFA, one of the groups always has to have uh, a restriction to, that their mean value is zero, then the other groups uh, are interpreted in terms of differences uh, from uh, that reference group. When we've looked at path diagrams and thought about uh, the relationship between uh, concepts and indicators between uh, latent variables and observed variables, uh, the arrow will be pointing from the latent variable to the observed indicator. Um, so what this is saying in, in theoretical terms is that the, uh, the latent variable causes the indicators. That's why the, the arrow points in that direction. So we can think of, uh, of that as meaning if we're trying to measure, let's say, uh, someone's um, social capital and we've asked lots of questions in, uh, in, a, in a questionnaire, uh, that what's actually causing their answers to, to those questions in the questionnaire is their underlying level of social capital. So uh, the causal arrow points from the, uh, the, the latent variable to the observed indicators. Now for many concepts that direction of causality uh, makes sense. Um, in other contexts the, 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 the idea that the causality flows from the latent variable to the indicator um, doesn't really make sense. So let's think of an example where we want to measure socioeconomic status and we're going to use indicators of uh, someone's level of education, what kind of occupation they have, their earnings and so on. And we want to combine these somehow into a latent variable that measures their socioeconomic status. Now, what's problematic about this in the, uh, the, the reflective indicators uh, context is that it doesn't really make sense to say that I have some underlying socioeconomic status and that if that were to change, then my educational level would change or my earnings would change or my occupation would change um, because actually causality is flowing in the other direction if there is any causality uh, going on here at all. So someone's level of education influences their socioeconomic status, as do their earnings. So now we're in a situation where the causality uh, makes more sense to flow from the indicator to uh, the latent variable. So the key point here is whether manipulating, uh, if we could somehow uh, change someone's uh, score on the, on the latent variable, would it make sense to change the, the score on the uh, observed indicator? Now, um, for some concepts that makes sense, for others it doesn't. And in the case where it doesn't make sense, we would essentially turn uh, the arrows round and make the arrows point from the indicators to the latent variable. Um, and in this context, we've now got what we call formative indicators rather than reflective indicators. Now, as I said, it's a different sort of uh, latent variable now that we're dealing with. Um, it's essentially a weighted index of the observed indicators um, and it doesn't have uh, a disturbance term. There's no error in it. So it's not uh, the same kind of uh, a, a variable as we would have with a reflective indicator.
The key thing is that the, the, in the path diagram, the arrows point from the indicator to the latent variable rather than the other way round. There are, uh, of course, some quite different procedures for estimating this kind of a model, um, but for now, uh, the concern is to understand the conceptual difference and the fact that we have the indicators uh, uh, related differently uh, to the uh, latent variables. Another uh, common procedure in confirmatory factor analysis um, is when a researcher may have a very large number of indicators for a latent construct or for a number of latent constructs. Uh, this is quite often the case um, in, um, in psychology where there are quite complex latent variables um, and each one maybe has uh, uh, 10, 12 or more indicators. One of the problems that researchers run into with this kind of data um, is that the model be can become extremely complex very quickly um, and there's lots of uh, difficulties that people can run into with estimation and interpretation and so on. Um, simply because there are so many relationships in the observed data because there are such a large number of, of, of indicators and latent variables. And this is often combined with uh, sometimes quite small sample sizes which can add to this problem. Um, so when uh, in this situation researchers will sometimes use an approach called item parceling um, which is a first stage of taking summed scores, adding up the scores for those uh, large numbers of items or for subsets of the subgroups of those items. Um, and then those, those subgroups of parceled items of, of sum scales then act as the, uh, the, the observed indicators for the latent variables. So this is a, a sort of a, 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 a parsimonious way of treating rather complex data. It does uh, rely on some uh, assumptions about the unidimensionality of the items in that parcel, uh, but it is uh, an approach that researchers who are in that context of having lots of uh, indicators for their latent variables and large numbers of latent variables uh, can pursue. Lastly, I'm going to talk about uh, a kind of confirmatory factor model uh, where the latent variables are not measured by observed indicators, uh, but are themselves measured by latent variables. So we have a, a sort of uh, a hierarchical structure where a first set of uh, latent variables are measured using observed indicators. We have to have observed indicators at some point in the model. But once that, that first set of uh, latent variables are measured, then a higher order factor can be added, which is a function of the, the first stage uh, latent variables. Now, this is an approach which is often uh, useful when our theories are not so much about the, uh, the relationship between variables, but are in the dimensional structure of the data. For example, uh, in psychology there are debates about the, uh, the number of uh, personality dimensions um, and often you know, belief systems and so on. Um, it's important to understand how many different dimensions that there are in addition to how those dimensions might be related to other variables. So um, intelligence, personality and so on, higher order factor models can be uh, useful. They can also be uh, applied in uh, a longitudinal context. So here's what a, a, a path diagram for a confirmatory uh, factor model with a higher order structure would look like. Um, we have at the bottom of the diagram now the uh, observed variables in rectangles. Um, there are nine of those and each uh, set of three is me measuring a, a latent variable um, and then the, the highest level variable eta1 um, is then uh, measured as a function of those three latent variables. So in this third video I've looked at some of the uh, important issues in uh, confirmatory factor analysis. Started off by looking at the, the general idea of using latent variables to measure uh, concepts in our theories. Uh, I've contrasted the, uh, the historical approach, the conventional approach of exploratory factor analysis or the unrestricted 
factor model to the more modern confirmatory factor model, the unrestricted factor model. We've looked at how we uh, can uh, uh, give a, uh, a metric, a scale to latent variables by fixing uh, one of the indicators to take the value one and therefore take the, uh, the scale uh, from that reference item. We've thought about how we can uh, analyze uh, means within a confirmatory factor model. Um, usually we're mainly focused on uh, associations, correlations, but we can also estimate means. Um, we've looked at some special cases uh, where we have uh, formative indicators rather than reflexive indicators, where we have a first stage of item parceling, um, when there are many, many indicators and uh, a large number of latent variables. And we finish by the special case of a higher order factor where a latent variable is measured not by uh, observed items but by uh, lower level uh, latent variables. In the previous video, we looked at how we can use latent variable models, in particular confirmatory factor analysis, to specify what we call the measurement model, um, the measurement part of a, a structural equation model. Um, in, in that component, we are um, seeking to get good measures of the concepts that we're interested in in our theoretical model. We're wanting to um, assess how well we are able to measure concepts to correct for error um, and uh, assess the, the overall fit of those models. Um, in this video, we will extend from the measurement model to include what we call structural equations, which specify our theory of how our concepts are related to one another. The steps in fitting structural equation models, we've already looked at in the previous videos, the idea of establishing a satisfactory measurement model. So we, we have a clear idea of the concepts that we're interested in that form our theoretical model. Um, we use latent variable models, confirmatory factor analysis and so on uh, to, to get good measures of those uh, concepts. Um, now we want to specify how those concepts are related to one another. And this is really the, uh, the part of the modeling where we are testing our, our causal theory. And what this really involves is specifying uh, regression paths between uh, the measured concepts. Now, why do we call these the, the, the structural equations? Um, well, it, it, the, the terminology here is a little bit loose. It really comes from um, uh, econometrics, where the idea of a, a structural equation uh, is one which embodies the formal theory of, of economics uh, within the equation. Um, the, the same is not so true in the uh, context that we're considering here, general structural equation modeling, um, but it still maintains the same idea that uh, the, the structural equations um, should embody our a priori theory of how the uh, concepts are, uh, are related. But in general, we won't have as strong a, a, a prior theory as we would do uh, in the econometric context. So we are going to fit regression paths uh, between the measured concepts um, and then we will uh, estimate the parameters of the model. Um, this will yield uh, uh, beta weights for the regression equations in, in the normal way that we would uh, get in an OLS regression, for example. And we would test hypotheses uh, about the, uh, the, the direction and magnitude and significance of those model parameters uh, which would be suggested by our theory. Um, and then the last step would be to assess the fit of the model. Um, if we have a, uh, a well-fitting model, um, then we can be confident um, that our, uh, our estimates of the model parameters are uh, consistent and unbiased. So those are the, the basic steps. And uh, we've already seen the measurement part of the model. So here, really, we're just extending what we saw in the previous video using confirmatory factor analysis 
uh, to incorporate regressions uh, between the uh, measured concepts. So this is a very simple structured equation model. Um, it's really equivalent to a bivariate regression model where we are regressing a dependent variable on a single independent variable. Um, but in this context, we now have uh, latent variables rather than directly observed variables. So uh, eta1 here is the, uh, the dependent variable and uh, xi1 is the, uh, the independent variable, the exogenous variable, uh, and we have a disturbance term in that, uh, for that regression. And we're going to estimate uh, some value for beta, which would then tell us what the relationship between um, eta1 and xi are in, in this example. So a very simple structured equation model, just extending uh, a regression path between two uh, latent variables. Now we can make this um, system of, of structured equations more complex. We've done that now by adding in uh, two more latent variables. Um, and we now have uh, a, a covariance between the two uh, exogenous variables. Um, that means that what we're saying is that we, these are uh, they're exogenous variables, they're, they're correlated with one another, but we aren't uh, making any statements about the, uh, our, our theory of the causal relationships between those variables. Um, but we have a, uh, a regression of uh, eta1 on xi1 um, and of eta2 on xi2. And we also have uh, a regression of eta1 uh, on xi2. So we, we are uh, regress, including a number of different regression uh, weights here. Uh, and that's something that um, is, is different than we would be used to in a, in a standard OLS regression context because we have variables which are now both endogenous and exogenous variables. So eta1 in this e example um, is a dependent variable uh, in, in one equation. Um, but is also a predictor, an independent variable in the second equation, because we can see we have a, a regression of uh, eta2 on eta1. So what we can also see here is that we've introduced um, uh, indirect effects, that we have potentially an effect here running from xi2 to eta2, which runs through eta1. So we can uh, estimate that sort of uh, relationship and we'll come uh, to look at that in, in a bit more detail later. So here we have a, an example of a, uh, a more uh, complicated model um, but this should relate to our theoretical expectations about what generated the data that we're analysing um, and so we would uh, recover the, uh, the parameter estimates for the beta weights in this model um, and we would check the, the, the fit of the data using the kind of indices that we uh, saw in the previous videos. And uh, if, the, if we have a well-fitting model, then we would make some inferences about uh, the, uh, the, the theory uh, that led us to, to develop this model. Do, does the, the, the model fit the data? Do the parameter estimates support uh, or reject the, the, the hypotheses? Another kind of model uh, that we can fit as a structure equation model is what's referred to as a multiple indicators, multiple causes model. Um, and there are a couple of things to, to note about this. You can see we have one latent endogenous variable, that's eta1, um, but the, the predictor variables in this model are uh, just observed variables, they're not latent. Um, so Something to note there is that a structured equation model does not have to comprise solely uh, of um, latent variables. It can be a mix of both directly observed and uh, latent variables. The sort of uh, use and context of this mimic model, as it's known, um, is often to assess um, the measurement properties of a latent variable. Um, and what's what's interesting to note here in this path diagram is that there is a regression uh, path between the observed variable x1 um, and z1. So z1 um, is predicting the latent variable but it's also um, got a regression path into the observed indicator of that latent variable. Now 
we would use this as a way of testing whether that, um, that x1 variable, the, the observed indicator, um, is perhaps functioning differently for uh, different subpopulations. So we can imagine perhaps that the three observed variables here are perhaps scores on a test. And if we find a significant um, beta weight running between Z1 and X1, that would tell us that um, depending on your score on Z1, you would have a, a higher or a lower probability of getting a, a correct answer to X1. And that would be over and above your, your score on the latent variable, which in this case would be some kind of uh, ability score. And that would tell us that there is, there's a problem with that item. It, it's what we refer to as differential item function, um, that uh, some groups in the population um, will have a higher probability of, of getting that item correct, even controlling for their level of ability. And this can generalize to attitude scales as well as uh, ability scales. So that's the sort of context that one might uh, use this kind of mimic model in. Now, we've seen that the process that we follow through uh, in, in structured equation modeling is to specify the measurement model, uh, get a good fitting model, then look, look at estimating uh, regression paths between the latent variables, um, which we use to test our theory. Then we check the, uh, the fit of the, the structural model, and if that fits, then we say, well, our, our, uh, our model fits the data, and, uh, and we have a, 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 a theory which is supported by the data. Now, that might lead us uh, to conclude um, that we've got the true model. This is the correct uh, data-generating model. But we need to be very careful uh, about uh, avoiding the temptation to make that strong conclusion. That's because um, with this kind of model, with uh, observational data, there are many different uh, potential generating mechanisms that could have produced the data um, and could give you equally good or perhaps even better fit. Now, here's a very simple way of uh, demonstrating that point. Here we have uh, a, a simple uh, bivariate regression of one latent variable measuring social trust on a variable, latent variable measuring uh, political trust. And this is using data from the European Social Survey. Um, and you can see that from the fit statistics there that this is a well-fitting model. And um, we have a, a, a significant beta weight there. So we find that, that the two concepts that, that political trust um, has a significant uh, effect on or, or relationship with to be more neutral on, on social trust. So we might lead this, this might lead us to conclude that this is the true model. But of course, we can simply reverse the direction of the, uh, the, 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 the path between social and political trust. This tells us something completely different. In fact, we reverse the, the causal direction that we see here. Um, but the fit of the model, and the beta weight indeed, is, is exactly the same with this completely opposite model. Um, so this is a caution about the strength of the conclusions that we can draw, even when our model fits the data well. It is not necessarily the true data generating model. So an important distinction um, in structural equation models uh, is between what we refer to as recursive and non-recursive models. Um, so all the models that we've looked at in these videos so far are recursive models. Um, and a recursive model is uh, a model where all of the causal effects are going in the same direction, are unidirectional, uh, and the disturbances, the error terms, are not correlated with one another. Um, and we can contrast this with a non-recursive model, uh, which is a model where we have some kind of feedback loop, where two variables are uh, causing each other, um, and 
therefore we have what we can refer to as reciprocal effects or where we have uh, correlated uh, disturbances. So uh, these, this difference is, is important because uh, it has implications for model identification um, and it has implications for um, whether we can, how we interpret and, 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 and uh, uh, trust the, the, the correctness of the estimates that we get from our models. So here's an example of a, a recursive path diagram model. Um, we have x1 uh, causing x2, and there's a disturbance term for that equation. x2 in turn causes y1, we have a disturbance term there, um, and also in that equation we have x3. So y1 is regressed on x2 and x3. But here we see that um, all of the causal effects are uh, going in one direction, um, and none of, none of the disturbances are, are correlated. So this would be a, a, a recursive model. A non-recursive model, on the other hand, um, will have some kind of feedback loop. And here you can see um, that there is such a feedback loop between y1 and x1. So x1 we have here is causing y1, and y1 uh, is causing uh, x1. So these are reciprocal effects. And this is actually quite a, 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 a plausible kind of causal mechanism. There are many examples uh, of situations where we would expect two variables to be uh, causing uh, each other. We can think, for example, of um, economic perceptions. The more people uh, perceive that the economy uh, is doing well, um, the more that they will support the government, and the more that people support the government, the more that they may think that the economy is doing well. So there are many examples where we would want to estimate uh, this type of equation. Um, and we also see here that we have a, a correlation between the two uh, disturbance terms, the errors uh, in those uh, structural equations. And that's in, indeed implied by the fact that we have this uh, reciprocal causal effect between y1 uh, and x1 means that uh, the disturbances must be correlated. Now, there are some grey areas. Um, and this results in what we refer to as partially recursive models. Here we see that we have um, a, a correlation between the disturbance terms, but we don't have any uh, direct effects amongst the endogenous variables in this model, the endogenous variables here being uh, y1 and x1. So in this case, we can treat this in terms of uh, identification as a recursive model, um, but here we do, in, in this diagram, we have uh, a, a direct effect amongst the endogenous variables. We have a regression uh, of y1 on x1, um, and we then also have this disturbance term correlation. So this would be treated uh, as a non-recursive model. Now, um, I said that recursivity or recursive versus non-recursive model status is, is important for identification, but that's not uh, terribly uh, interesting from a sort of analytical perspective. Recursivity is also important really because um, a recursive model is always identified and it's simple to estimate. We can estimate um, uh, recursive models using OLS, using a, a, a set of, uh, of, of OLS models. Um, but that simplicity is also rather restrictive. It means that we can't estimate the more complex kinds of models uh, that we would often want to. So introducing a, a non-recursive model means that we have more flexibility in the kinds of uh, spe model specifications that we can use. And these are actually a lot of the reasons why many analysts want to use structural equation modeling, structural equation modeling software, because it's, it's actually very easy uh, to specify this kind of model. Um, but we have to be aware that just because we can specify a model um, as a path diagram and we will generate some parameter estimates, um, that doesn't mean that we can always uh, trust them as being uh, valid uh, estimates. So um, non-recursive models, despite being more flexible, uh, also can be challenging in terms of identification. Um, and we'll often require, in order to uh, uh, achieve an identified model, we will need to use um, other variables in the model that which may not be um, of direct substantive interest in the model, but we need them nonetheless uh, for identification purposes. 
So, as I said, if we have a, a model, it may be empirically identified, it doesn't mean necessarily that we can uh, trust the parameter estimates. Um, and in particular, if we want to have uh, unbiased and consistent estimates for reciprocal paths, these are when we have arrows running between two uh, variables in a, in a, in a model, um, we have to make some quite strict and some would argue often implausible assumptions about the variables in the model. So in particular in this sort of context with reciprocal effects, uh, we need to uh, assume that we have some exogenous variables in the model um, that we can treat as instrumental variables. And this is an, another important idea for uh, understanding and implementing this kind of uh, non-recursive model, the idea of an instrumental variable. And to understand what we mean by an instrumental variable in this context, it's useful first to understand another concept, which is that of uh, an endogenous regressor. And here we've got a, a simple path diagram to help understand what we mean by an endogenous regressor. So we have here y1 regressed on x1, we want to estimate beta, where we'd ideally like to treat beta as the causal effect of x1 uh, on y1. Um, but we also see here that we have a, a, a covariance or a correlation um, between the disturbance term in this equation and x1, which is the predictor. Now, we, we know from our uh, OLS classes that this is uh, an assumption that we have to make uh, in OLS that we don't have a correlation between the error term and the predictors. If we, if we find that there is, a, if there is a, a, such a correlation, um, then we have what's referred to as an endogenous regressor. The X1 is an endogenous regressor. And this is because, it can be for a number of reasons, but um, will often be because of some unobserved variable um, that we, we should have in our model that maybe is uh, 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 related to both uh, X1 and Y1, or it may be because of uh, simultaneous uh, causal effects, that X1 is causing Y1 and Y1 is causing X1, the sort of reciprocal effects that we're interested in here. That would generate this, this correlation. So um, when we have this kind of a situation, we need uh, an instrumental variable for X1. If we, are a if we want to be able to interpret the beta coefficient as the causal effect of X1 uh, on Y1. So uh, an instrumental variable um, is a variable that's going to deal with this endogenous regressor problem. Um, and it does this by introducing exogenous variability into the endogenous regressor. And to have the properties of, a, of an instrumental variable, then which we'll refer to as, as Z, our instrumental variable will be Z in this context, um, the, the, the instrument must um, cause the endogenous regressor, but not cause the outcome. Now, there are lots of different examples of, of instrumental variables that, that have been used in the empirical literature, um, and we'll come on to some of those. Um, but one good way of thinking about a, a, an instrumental variable is the assignment variable in a randomized control trial. The randomization which determines whether someone is allocated to the treatment or to the control condition. This is a perfect in, uh, uh, instrumental variable because it's, cor it's very strongly correlated with whether you are in the uh, treatment or the control group, but it is uncorrelated with whatever the outcome is in the randomized control trial. So uh, that's a good way of thinking about what an instrumental variable is. And uh, the sorts of uh, variables that we will be looking to use as instruments should come as close as possible to that sort of uh, um, randomization type of variable. So this is what we're looking for in terms of a path diagram here. Um, we've got uh, an endogenous regressor uh, x1 and we need 
um, a, an instrument, which is Z1 here, which causes X1, um, but doesn't cause uh, Y1 other than through its effect on uh, X1. So you can see it has a, an indirect effect on uh, Y1, but not a direct effect. So this would be uh, a, an instrumental variable. As I said, there are many papers, particularly in economics, which have used natural uh, variability, natural experiments, if you like. Um, and one example is the, the Vietnam lottery draft, which determined whether um, US citizens were uh, 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 allocated to go to Vietnam or not. This was done on the basis of a, uh, a random lottery. So if you wanted to, if you want to assess the effect of uh, going to Vietnam on later outcomes like your earnings, your education, uh, your mental health and so on, um, then you can use that initial lottery draft as a, an instrument for uh, going to Vietnam War. Another one that's been used is proximity to uh, your nearest college um, for studying the effects of education on earnings. Obviously, um, if you just look at the relationship between um, education and earnings, there are many uh, unobserved variables that would mean that uh, you couldn't just take the, the simple correlation between education and earnings as a causal effect. But if you can use something like proximity to, your, to, a, to a college, um, that can have a direct effect on education, but not a direct effect on, on your earnings other than through uh, its effect on education. The third example might be um, variability in the, uh, the compulsory schooling age. This can vary across uh, geographic boundaries. Um, in US states, for example, have uh, different compulsory schooling ages, or in the UK, uh, there was a, an increase um, in the compulsory uh, schooling age uh, from 15 to 16 in um, 1973. And this can be used to as an instrument for, again, the effects of education on uh, later outcomes, such as earnings, because the policy change um, introduced random variability into how much schooling people uh, obtained, um, but it wouldn't have had any direct effect on earnings. So those are some examples of, of instrumental variables and it should give you an idea um, that you have to meet some quite strict requ requirements to, to be a good instrumental variable. And e even for these three quite well-known examples, um, there have been criticisms of these as whether they really are uh, valid instruments. So again, this is something of a caution because non-recursive models are easy to specify. Here's an example, again, using the European Social Survey data, uh, where we're looking at uh, the relationship between um, life satisfaction, uh, happiness, and social trust. Um, scholars have been interested in, in what the relationship is here. And this model specifies uh, reciprocal uh, causality uh, between these, uh, these variables. Now, if you just try to estimate that model um, without the uh, two exogenous variables at the bottom of the, uh, the, the diagram, whether you're married and, and um, your earnings, it would be unidentified. So these variables are, are acting as instrumental variables in the model, um, but it's not really plausible to assume that they are uh, valid instruments because we have to assume that neither of them has a direct effect on the other latent variable in this model. Each one only uh, causes one latent variable, but it's not really uh, reasonable to assume that your income uh, is not related to, uh, to your level of social trust. We know that's uh, an implausible um, uh, assumption. So we have to be careful just because we can uh, estimate a, and we get parameter estimates for a structural equation model which is non-recursive, uh, we have to check our assumptions uh, that are needed to make that identification and, and assess whether we can really uh, trust uh, the, the estimates.
So one of the uh, main kinds of models that uh, um, analysts uh, will use structural equation models for uh, are for mediation kinds of models. Um, one can estimate mediation models in, in other uh, modeling frameworks, but uh, SEMs are particularly well suited uh, to mediation models. Um, what we are talking about really here is, is the, the, the foc a focus on not simply the, the direct effect of one variable on another, which is what we are implicitly focusing on and, and often explicitly focusing on in a, an OLS context, but we want to decompose uh, the, 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 the effects of one variable on another into those direct effects, but also effects that are running through uh, other variables uh, in the system. So um, we are going to be interested in the indirect as well as the, uh, the, the, the direct and the total effects. Um, and this is because oftentimes what we are interested in is understanding causal mechanisms, not just whether two variables are causally related, but how they are causally related. So we might, for example, um, conclude that um, a, a gaining a degree at university increases your earnings. It might have a, a causal effect on, on, on your earnings in later life. Um, and that's a, uh, a useful and interesting uh, conclusion to be able to draw. But there might be secondary questions about how that actually happens. What is the mechanism that underlies um, the, uh, the, the earnings return to gaining a, a degree? Um, from a sort of uh, a human capital perspective, uh, we might expect this to be through increasing the individual's skill level or their productivity, which would then, um, from economic theory, um, uh, lead us to expect them to have higher earnings. On the other hand, from a more kind of sociological perspective, it might just be that the, the degree is, a, is just a credential um, and that the, the, it hasn't really endowed the individual with any greater skill uh, or productivity, but it's just given them a, a, a certificate which enables them to get to the, the top of the queue uh, ahead of people who don't have that degree. And those kinds of um, mechanism questions are often uh, very important for policy uh, and are, are at the heart of what we're uh, doing when we're fitting mediation models. We've seen a, a couple of examples of path diagrams with uh, mediation uh, already. Um, here we see uh, an, a, an example where we have eta2, a latent variable, which is regressed on eta1, and we have um, a third variable z, uh, which is our kind of exogenous variable here. Um, and we can look at the, the, the different effects that x has on uh, eta2, um, first of all, the, the direct effect of Z on eta2 is the uh, beta weight beta3 here, the, the, the direct path. So that's what we would uh, normally be uh, focusing on in a, in a regression equation, uh, that direct effect. Um, but we can also estimate the indirect effect here because we've got the um, beta1 coefficient of eta1 on, on Z and the beta2 uh, coefficient of uh, eta2 on eta1. Now, if we take the product of those uh, two uh, parameter parameters, then that will give us the indirect effect uh, of z on, on eta2. So that's how we can um, algebraically recover the, uh, the indirect effect of one variable on the other, is taking the product of the two beta weights. Um, and then we will perhaps be interested in the total effect. Um, and this is the sum of the uh, indirect and the direct effect. So we might, might find, for example, um, that both uh, direct and indirect effects are non-significant, but there is still a, a significant total effect. So we can get different patterns um, of uh, uh, and understandings of an effect of one variable on another by looking at these, these different uh, effect parameters. Um, we sometimes distinguish between um, partial uh, and perfect mediation. Um, so for example, if we fitted a model that just regressed 
eta 2 on Z, and we found a, a significant um, and, and substantial effect there. Um, then if we add in the uh, eta 1 predictor, if the, uh, the effect of Z now becomes non-significant, but the, the indirect effect is significant, then we would refer to this as perfect mediation. The, the to the, all of the effect of Z on eta 2 flows through uh, eta 1. Where it, there is still a residual effect, i.e. a significant path between Z and eta 2, that would be referred to as uh, partial mediation. Now, as I said, we can um, specify these kinds of models using a series of OLS models, and we can uh, recover the indirect effects by taking the, the product of the, uh, the, 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 the respective uh, direct effects for, to, to get the indirect and total effects. Um, one of the advantages of, of, um, uh, of doing this in a SEM framework using SEM software, however, is that those kind of calculations are done for you uh, and uh, just provided in the output. And additionally, um, there are various ways of, of, of directly calculating uh, the standard errors of those uh, indirect uh, uh, paths. So we can either calculate uh, the, uh, the standard errors for these mediated paths using what's called the, the delta method, a parametric approach, um, which assumes uh, multivariate normality, um, or more commonly now using non-parametric approaches like bootstrapping, resampling from uh, the sample data to, to generate an empirical sampling distribution. And if we do that, of course, we, we need to have the, the raw data rather than the, the covariance matrix. So um, the SEM framework is, is very convenient for doing this kind of modeling. Um, we can have more complex uh, mediated paths that run not just from uh, one variable through another to a third variable, but through several variables. Um, and we can get uh, estimates of those indirect and total effects and their standard errors. Here's an example again using the, uh, the European Social Survey, uh, an actual model here where we are looking at the, uh, the effect of, of, be, uh, of being in a high income group, your, your, your income, on your level of social trust, um, and uh, breaking that down into the direct effect of income on uh, social trust through, uh, and also the indirect effect uh, through uh, your level of, of happiness or, or, or life satisfaction. And you can see here um, that the, 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 the beta weights on the path diagram there uh, indicate uh, that there are, uh, uh, these are, these are standardized uh, parameter estimates. Um, so you can see that there, are, there is an effect of uh, being high income on, uh, on social trust, and there seems to be an indirect path there um, so we could just take the product of uh, the 0.09 and the 0.35 uh, parameters uh, to get the indirect effect. If we do that, um, we get a, a figure of about 0.32, which uh, if you look at this slide here, you can see uh, this is some output from uh, AMOS software. And you can see there that the, in, in red, um, the indirect effect of the column variable, which is high income, on the row variable, which is social trust, is 0.032, uh, which is uh, the, the product of those two coefficients to give you the, uh, the indirect effect. And you can see that all of the possible uh, path uh, estimates are, are provided there directly in the output. Um, also, in SEM software, um, you will get, as I said, the, uh, the, the standard errors, either through bootstrapping or parametric, uh, estimation, uh, and here we see that the, the two-tailed p-value for that indirect effect of uh, income on social trust is, is significant uh, at the 95% level of confidence. So we could uh, reject the null hypothesis that there is no uh, indirect path uh, between income and uh, social trust. So that's a very brief look at um, the, the way that we can fit mediation models and what some of the advantages are of doing this within a SEM context. Um, it's important to remember a couple of limitations here. One is that um, in, in this kind of modeling environment, we're 
really limited to continuous mediating variables. We very difficult to estimate these kinds of models when the mediator, um, when the when the, uh, the, the 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 z variable is continuous, and when we have a mix of continuous and categorical variables. Um, it's also really not a framework for um, the the kind of uh, clean causal effect estimates and um, that we, we were talking about in the uh, uh, in the previous video on uh, instrumental variables. Really, this is just decomposing covariances. Um, there are other approaches uh, that have a more of a causal uh, estimate focus using the sort of the, the, the potential outcomes framework, and that would be using uh, G computation and so on. Um, we won't be covering those uh, in, in this video, but it's important to be aware that there are other frameworks for, for uh, estimating these kinds of mediation models which are uh, a bit more modern and have uh, uh, a more robust uh, causal inference behind them.